Excuse me. Do appreciate you coming tonight. As young folks go over with Brother Tyler, I want you to remember them this evening and you keep praying for them. Brother Tyler doing a good job with our youth folks. We appreciate him. And You've got a Bible with you tonight. I want you to turn to the little book of Lamentations tonight. The book of Lamentations is going to be looking in chapter number 3 tonight. Lamentations chapter number 3, going to be looking at just a couple of verses uh, this evening. We're going to take a departure from the, uh, from the uh, series that we've been working on for some time, Clarity for Common Concerns. We're going to take the next few weeks uh, off from that, Lord willing. Uh, this tonight we're going to, be, uh, uh, going to be dealing with the subject of revival and speaking about revival and uh, trying to prepare our hearts and get ready uh, to receive what the Lord would like to do in our lives. And, uh, of course, um, Brother Todd comes, and then following the following couple of weeks, more than likely, we'll be dealing with Easter, leading up to Easter. Uh, but tonight, we're thinking about uh, the subject of revival. You found Lamentations chapter uh, number 3. Look at verse number 40, and go ahead and stand to your feet. The Word of God says, Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Let us lift up our heart with our hands unto God in the heavens. We have transgressed and have rebelled. Thou hast not pardoned. Father, it is good to be here tonight. Father, we know that this opportunity is a privilege. Lord, there are folks all over the world that would love to be able to have the freedoms that we do tonight. And God, oftentimes we take our freedoms for granted. Lord, may we never do that. We thank you that you put us in, in, in a nation that has been characterized by freedom, in a nation, Lord, that was founded on biblical principles by people that, uh, that served you. And God, we pray that this nation would never forget that. God, we pray that even during this election year that your people would rise up. Lord, uh, that they wouldn't vote their pocketbook. Lord, that they wouldn't vote popular opinion. But God, that we'd look at biblical principles and vote for men, God, uh, that would stand on these principles without fear. Father, I pray that we'd stand up now and call good, good and evil, evil. Lord, it's time to take this country back. Help us to be a voice, God. I know that if this country is to have any hope, Father, it has to come from you. Even though we should elect uh, Christians, God, we realize that there can't be any fix unless it come from you. So we pray that you'd get involved, God, right on the personal level. God, revival starts in our heart. God, it's got to start with one person. And I pray tonight that these in attendance, Lord, they we just get it through our hearts and our minds tonight that, Lord, it needs to start with us. For us to, to get serious about your work in our lives. God, we pray that we commit ourselves to you, that you'd show us things. Lord, oftentimes we don't even realize the depths of our sinfulness. God, that you'd give us a picture of ourselves, God, that we would be, uh, that we would uh, make haste to return to you. Father, if you show us what we really look like in your sight, I believe that we'd turn to you, and I pray that you'd help us, God. I pray for these people that's gathered tonight, that you'd bless them exceedingly, Lord. I pray for the revival meeting this coming, Lord, that you'd fill the house, God, and that you'd not only fill the house, but you'd fill us with your spirit. God, I pray that you'd save some during the time. Father, I pray that some would recommit themselves unto you. And I pray that when it's all done, Lord, that we would see genuine revival that would last forever. Lord, we don't want it to be over. We don't want it to be done. We realize that you want to use your people. Help us tonight. We sure need you, Lord, and we love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to deal tonight with these uh, three verses and, and talking about, I was looking at this scripture, actually reading through in my daily reading here uh, in the last uh, uh, week or so and came across 
uh, this scripture in the book of Lamentations. Don't, uh, you really don't hear a lot of preaching out of the book of Lamentations, but there's a lot of good stuff here. And, and I was thinking as I, as I read these verses, especially uh, verse number 40, kind of uh, just, just stuck out to me. The way that, that the prophet said this, he said, let us search and try our ways. Let us search and try our ways. Now, uh, I want to give you tonight about three keys for, uh, for seeing revival. Number one is there needs to be a personal awareness. There needs to be a personal awareness. That, that's what he's saying here. I believe in verse number 40. He said, let us search and try our ways. Many times we don't, maybe, maybe we don't realize where we are with the Lord. Maybe we don't realize how, how far away from the Lord we are. But when we begin to, uh, to examine ourselves, there, there's this uh, 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 personal awareness here. We, we examine not only, I want to give you three things that we should examine. We should examine our actions. We should examine our motives. And we should examine our thoughts. Now, dealing with actions tonight, if we're, there's a personal awareness, what, what are our actions? How do we behave ourselves in this world? What's our manner of living? We talk about this a lot. Now, uh, our manner of living should be befitting followers of Christ, right? We ought to reflect well on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We, we shouldn't do anything that would bring reproach on the name of Christ or hurt the witness, the testimony, of our church, right? We need to be very mindful about that. Now, what are our ways? Well, we talked about this recently. We know that God expects us to be holy, right? He's called us uh, not to uncleanliness, but He's called us unto holiness. He said, be ye holy as I am holy. Now, uh, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, it says, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which we have, uh, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, you're not your own, I'm not my own, this is not mine to do with what I want, but it's a gift from God, and I should treat it that way, I, I and you, we as Christians are a temple, he said you're not your own, but you're, you're bought with a price, is what he goes on to say, he said therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, it belongs to God anyway, you better use it to glorify God, that's what uh, Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians. We ought to glorify God. Somebody has once said that the chief end of man is to glorify God. And, and rightly so. That's what the, the scriptures teach us. Now, uh, we, we consider our actions. What, what we do. And the Bible says uh, that in 1 Thessalonians 5.22 that we should abstain from all appearance of evil. Not only should we not do anything that's not right, we shouldn't even go anywhere near anything that doesn't look right. We ought to be real careful about that. There's a lot of things I, I've told you in the past, there's a lot of things that I just can't do because it doesn't look right. It may not, you may have a, you may be, uh, have a perfectly uh, innocent reason for doing it, but if somebody else may construe it as wrong, you'll damage your testimony. We've got to be very careful about what we're doing. We've got to be very careful about our actions, not only our ways in our actions, but our words. Now, we've got to be real careful with our words, right? Our words have a great deal of weight and our words say a lot about us, right? Our, uh, the way that we talk, our, our manner of speaking to those around us, if we're, we're rough and gruff, people may conclude that we're not very happy, that we're not very easy to get along with. Now, many, many of us maybe use words that we shouldn't use from time to time. Maybe uh, not only uh, might folks curse and take uh, uh, use words that they should 
shouldn't, and I don't think that we ought to do that. Certainly that's not befitting a child of God. That should not. In, in, in fact, that was one of the ways that, that Peter tried to prove to people that he wasn't a follower of Jesus was that he cursed. That testified that he didn't follow Jesus. So a, a follower of Christ shouldn't be known as somebody uh, who curses, who shouldn't be known as somebody who, who runs their mouth in a reckless way. We have to be very careful about that. Ephesians 4, 29 says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So we need to measure our words, right? We need to be careful what we say. Many times we, we say things wrong or say the wrong thing. Sometimes we just say it in the wrong manner and we offend people. Now, uh, the the biggest problem that I have, I guess, is not it's not cursing or maybe maybe it's not being mean to people, but I probably joke a little bit more than I should from time to time. And, and you know, some of you may be like that too. And I, and I forget that some people don't always know how to take that. So, some folks are offended. You know, they, they think that you, you, you know, they take you real, real, real serious. And you know that I'm oftentimes not uh, very serious unless I'm standing behind this pulpit. In fact, sometimes you, you can hurt folks' feelings pretty good. We had a new uh, therapist down at the nursing home here a while back. And she's kind of quiet, and I was trying to, to, to draw her out, you know, and get her to talk, and I was kind of picking at her a little bit, and she took me, she son, and made her cry. I felt about that tall, and I, I didn't even know that I'd hurt the lady's feelings. Somebody come and told me, said, you really, you really hurt that girl? I said, hurt her, how did I hurt her feelings? I, I didn't even know what it was, but I was just joking with her about something, and she thought I was serious, and I, and I went back, and I told her, I said, honey, I said, I wouldn't hurt your feelings for the whole world. I promise you. I, I didn't I said, you don't pay. And this girl was walking by. And she said, don't you know you can't pay no attention to that preacher? You ought to know better than that, she said. But you have to be careful, right? Now, we all do things like that. Sometimes we got to be careful about our actions. That's what he said. Let us search and he said, let us search and try our ways, our, our actions in public, our actions in private. We need to look at what we do in private. Who are we when nobody's around? Do we do things when nobody's around that we wouldn't do if, they're in, if, if they were there in person? What do you do with your time? Do you, do you spend time serving the Lord? like y'all to? What do you do with your money? Do you realize that not only does your body belong to the Lord, but your money belongs to the Lord as well? It's a whole lot easier uh, to, to give tithes and offerings if you look at it all as belonging unto God, right? God loves a cheerful giver. And I've said many times before, i say it again, if you, uh, uh, if you show me your checkbook register, I'll show you how serious you are about the Lord. You, wherever you spend your money, that, that usually uh, spells out how serious you are about your relationship with God. Do you set uh, your tithe aside when, when you get paid? That's none of my business, but I think the Bible teaches that very clearly. We have to examine our actions. Do we do the right thing, even when someone's not looking? What about our motives? Why, why do we do what we do? Why do we come to church? I've thought about that a lot. Have you ever thought about that? Some people don't think you ought to uh, don't don't think it's a big deal to go to church. Some people don't think it's a big deal to, to miss church. They don't mind going here and yonder. Some folks just pop in when they feel like it. And uh, you know, I'll be honest with you. I, I I don't have a lot of dealings with a lot of different churches. I know about two churches, this and here in my home church. I own two churches I've ever had anything much to do with. But after I got saved, nobody had to tell me I need to get on down to the church house when the doors was open. I felt like that's somewhere we ought to be, you know. Um, I, it's pretty hard. The Bible teaches us over and over and over. Not only does it say forsaking not the assembly of thyselves in the house of God, such as manner of some, but we should be edifying each other. Number one, I get fed in the house of God. I get to hear teaching and preaching. Even, even, even preachers need that. I mean, I listen to preaching every day. I, I, I listen to uh, Adrian Rogers regular. I listen to John MacArthur. I love to hear good preaching. I, I love to get fed. I love to get together with God's people. We need to be together. I tell you what, this world is hard enough. We need other Christians that we can depend upon. We need to be in the house of God. Why do you come? Is it to build up? 
the body? Do you come because you feel like, uh, uh, do you come to, you, 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 you just feel like you're satisfying somebody else? Maybe, maybe some of you men, you might come because your wife drug you down here. Some of you kids, you, you might come because your mom and daddy didn't give you much of choice. But I, I, hey, and I'll tell you, I think that's all right. I don't think you have a choice. You know, I, I told a fellow one time, I said, you know, around my house, I said, if you put your feet down under my table and eat your supper, you don't have no choice but do what I tell you. When we go to church, you go to church. You, you don't get a choice in that. You know, when you, when you grow up, move out, and you're making your own living, I often wonder if my kids will still go to church and still serve the Lord. I pray that they do. But as long as they're living with me and I'm responsible for, their, uh, for feeding them, you better believe that they're going to be in the house of God unless they're sick, unless they've got a really good reason. Why, why, do, we, why do we do what we do? Why, why do we serve God? Why, why, do we, why, why are we involved in a water? Why would we drive a van? Why would we teach Sunday school? Why would we do all these things? Why, why do we do what we do? We need to examine our motives. I, I believe that the Lord is just as concerned with our motive as he is about what we're doing. And if we don't do things with a pure heart, you know, so, sometimes folks will get the idea that if they're not being appreciated, they'll quit. They'll, they'll just, if somebody's not recognizing them, and I tell you, if you're doing something in this church, you know, especially if it's something that's not where everybody's going to normally see it, you're probably going to get your feelings hurt if you're waiting on somebody to recognize you for what you're doing. Because it probably won't happen. I mean, if you... if it, 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 folks, it's just they don't oftentimes notice what gets done until it's not getting done. Until it's no, nobody thinks much about the light bulbs till there's one missing, do they? Nobody thinks anything about the heat being uh, turned on and nice and warm in the building in the middle of February until they come in one Sunday morning and it's 45 degrees in the sanctuary. And then they think, well, somebody's got to turn that heat on, don't they? <laughs> Well, I tell you, we need to examine our motives. Now, not only uh, is personal awareness, we, we need to be careful, examine our actions and our motives, but our thoughts as well. Probably, probably our thoughts may be the biggest problem that we have. He said, let us search and try our ways. Our, our thought patterns oftentimes really hurt us. The Bible says in Psalm 139, David said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Know my thoughts, he said, and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So uh, we realize as we think about our thoughts, our thoughts, how many of you realize thoughts have power over who you are? What we think, it, it, it really dictates who we are in many ways. What consumes our thoughts dictates who we are in many ways. Now, uh, Colossians 3 says, Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. So what we think on, if we think on things of a spiritual nature, more than likely we're more spiritual people. If we think on things of a more fleshly nature, a temporal nature, more likely we're apt to be more fleshly People, set your mind on things above. We, we have to learn. Everybody has thoughts. Did you know that? J. Vernon McGee said one time, I read, probably told you this before, he, he, said, he, said if, he, he said, if I knew what you all was thinking, he said, I probably wouldn't speak to you. And he said, if you all knew what I was thinking, he said, you probably wouldn't listen to me. So uh, we all have problems sometimes with our thoughts. We all have things coming to our mind that shouldn't. We know, uh, we know that these things happen. Now, uh, we have to learn uh, to control our thoughts. 2 Corinthians 3 or 10 says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring it into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. That means when you're having a bad thought, you're ready to revenge that, to get rid of that bad thought. Thinking on things above helps you to put things out of your mind that shouldn't be there. So 
remembering Scripture, memorizing Scripture, quoting Scripture, thinking on things of the Lord, meditating. When, when you know that thoughts are going to come in your mind, take every thought under the captivity of Christ. Would, would Christ like me to indulge this thought? Is this a thought that would be pleasing to my Lord? You, you see, this is a, an awareness a personal awareness. If we're ever to really see revival, we've got to become aware of what's going on in our lives, how we act, what we say, what we do, our thoughts, and our motives. Now, not only do you see that here, that's one of the keys to experience a revival, but revival, but you not only see personal awareness in verse number 40, but you find a, a purposed action here as well. If you're, if you're to, see, if you're to uh, see genuine revival in your life, in, in your heart, in your time, you've you got to make it a purposed action. You got to do something. You 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 have to do something. And 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 the Bible's pretty clear here. Verse number forty one. Look at it if you will. Says, "Let us lift up our heart with our hands unto God in the heavens. Let us lift up our heart." What's he talking about? Well, I believe he's talking about confession. Now we 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 have uh, 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 we we have an awareness now. We have this personal awareness. God has showed us that oftentimes our ways and our words and our thoughts and our imaginations are not what they should be. Even our motives are not what they should be. So what do I do when I learn that? If I'm going to draw near to God, it takes a confession. There, there must be a time of confession where we lift our hearts, we lift our hands unto the Lord, and we, we pour out our heart. We, we speak to the Lord. We confess these things. How many of you remember what it's like when you first got saved? You remember when, can you go back to that time? Do you remember what you, what you said? Uh, and and I, there, I don't see in the Bible, uh, uh, I don't see in the Bible necessarily a sinner's prayer there. But I, I don't know if there's anybody here ever got saved without praying either at the same time. You, you probably prayed, and, and I, I think it's a prayer of confession. It's, it's a prayer of confession. Not that God don't know. And I told you when I got saved in that, in that 1997 Freightliner, and I, I got down on my knees there and buried my head in, in that, in that, um, in that sleeper berth and, and in that mattress there, and I and I confessed, I told you I confessed it. I believe everything I ever even thought about doing. I think I confessed it all. And you know, God knew that before I confessed it. But there was something, I mean, it, it, when God saved me, it, it was like a relief. As I, it, 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 as I confessed that stuff before God, it was like a burden that was lifted off my shoulders that you just wouldn't believe. I didn't have to carry that old mess around anymore. God forgave me of that stuff, and it started right there on my knees. As I confessed unto God, not that he didn't know, he already know, but he already knew, but we lift our hearts unto the Lord. We pour ourselves out unto God. The Bible says <coughs> that we're to pour ourselves out unto the Lord like that. We, we, we should come unto God. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us, right? If, if we'll turn unto him, we pour our hearts out unto God. Not only that, but we just be completely honest with ourselves. We, we be completely honest with ourselves. The Bible says in, in, in Proverbs 28, 13, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Now, now you've got a choice to make. I think Brother Tyler used that scripture over who was in there. I believe he used that pro Proverbs that I just uh, read to you right there uh, Wednesday night in a one. And, and, and you, if you try to hide your sin, and many of us do, we try to hide. We don't want anybody to know, do we? And, and when we go to great lengths to hide our sin, and, and you know, if you think, I, I think about going to great lengths, I think about David, don't you? He went to great lengths to find lengths to find to hide his infidelity um, with Bathsheba, didn't he? But the Lord knew all the long. The Lord knew all. Uh, he may have hid it from from most of his loyal subjects, but God knew all along what was in his heart. 
You see, we must, uh, we must be honest. We, we've got to confess. We pour it out unto God. Not only do we see this purpose, action is confession, but verse number 40, if we look back again, it said, let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Right there it is in the scripture. Confession, and then a, there's a commitment. There's a confession. So, so I, I have turned or I have confessed my sin to God, now I commit myself to follow God. Now, I've confessed it. He knows I'm guilty of it. And I know that I'm guilty of it. We have agreed. Me and God have agreed that I'm a pretty sorry individual. Okay? And, and after this confession, there must be a commitment. There must be a commitment. And and. and we're missing this today. Many, uh, what used to be Bible-believing churches are missing repentance today. What do you mean? Repentance is turning from something and turning to something. They say, well, come just as you are. Now, I believe you can, but you don't leave just like you was. When you come to the Lord, He changes you forever. He cleans you up and makes you somebody new. We, we have to understand that repentance is necessary. He said, try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Turn again unto God. That's what revival is. Getting back to where we once were. Turning again unto the Lord. Now, Ephesians says this in chapter number four. Wherefore, putting away all lying, speak every man the truth with his neighbor. So if you had a problem with a lying tongue before you got saved, put it away. Don't lie no more. Tell people the truth. I was reading J. Vernon McGee one time. He said he believed that most problems that Christians had could be solved by simply following one, one uh, uh, idea. He said, just tell the truth. He said, tell the truth. He said, most, most of the problems we have uh, somewhere are rooted in a lie somehow or another. So he, he says here to tell the truth. Speak every man truth to his neighbor for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Turn. If your problem was anger, if your problem was anger, listen, everybody's going to get angry and sometimes you got good reason to get angry. But don't sin in your anger. Don't, don't, don't make it worse than it has to be. And, and we're probably all guilty of that. He said, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. And he said, let him that stole steal no more. If you had a problem with taking things that didn't belong to you, quit that. Listen, whatever you did before, stop. He said, but rather let him labor. If he stole before, let him work for it now. Working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Then he went on to say again, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Measure those words. Is it going to be good for somebody what I'm saying? What about uh, uh, when, you, when you're out at the ball game and you're shouting at those folks out there on the, the court, on the basketball course or court or, or, or out there at the football game? How many times have you seen Christians make a fool out of themselves at a ball game? You ever seen it? Come on, raise your hand. I know you've seen it. Okay, two of you did. I've seen it a lot of times. I've, uh, I've had some talks with some people that, made, uh, that, that really didn't make a good showing at a ball game. Forgot who they were in Christ when they went to the ball game. You can't be out here huffing and puffing and cussing and carrying on and representing Christ well. Uh, you, we have to be careful. It's a, a purposed action. There, there's a confession and there's also a commitment here. Repentance is necessary and that spells out the commitment. Listen, the, the Bible says in 2 Peter 3, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants us to turn from our sin. And, and, and to turn unto him, and I've, I've said it like this, boy, if Christ was here on this wall, 
I can see me. Christ better be over here. Okay, if Christ is in this wall and sin is over here on this wall, you, you can't embrace Christ without turning your back on sin and you can't embrace sin without turning your back on Jesus, right? So we've got to be a single-minded Christian. We've got to embrace the Lord, confess and commit ourselves to God, repent of our sin. Not only is it a purposed action, not only does it require personal awareness, but also in verse number 42, you find that there's a public acknowledgement. There's a public acknowledgement. Do you believe that what we need in this country is a revival? Do you believe that what we need as God's people is revival? Do you believe that what we need as a church and a nation is a revival? I believe that it is. I, I believe that it is. And I think it takes a, a public acknowledgement. He, verse 42 says, We have transgressed and have rebelled. We have transgressed and have rebelled. Now, what do we acknowledge? Well, we, we acknowledge uh, our nature and our needs as well. That's what that verse is saying. Our nature. What is our nature? Man, we're rebellious. That's what our nature is. We're rebellious against God. We don't want to do what God wants us to do many times because it goes against our flesh. Paul said that. He said there's a war going on in my flesh. If you're a Christian, you've got a dual nature. You've got, a, you've got the Christ nature because the Spirit of God dwells in you, but you live in this sin-cursed body, and it wants to do ungodly things, and you're going to have problems with it every day. You're going to have problems with it, and you've got to make up your mind. And I've got to make up my mind every day. What am I going to do today? Am I going to give in today? You're faced with temptation every day, and I'm faced with temptation every day. We go through trials all the time. What are we going to do? Lord, I'm going to walk when I get up every morning. I'm going to commit myself to walk in the Spirit every day of my life. Lord, help me today to deny the flesh and to walk in the Spirit. We're, we have a rebellious nature. We don't, we don't want to follow God. That's what happened to Satan. Satan didn't want to follow God. He wanted to be like the Most High. He wanted to be the man. It wasn't enough to be the number one angel. He wanted to be like God. He wanted to be in the place of God. And that's, what, that's how he appealed to Eve. That's, that's what he said. He said, eh, half God said... He said, God doth know that you will be like God. That's what he was saying. He was tempting her to be like God. Isn't it a godly thing to want to be like God? I mean, that's basically what he was saying. She was knowing the whole time what God had commanded them not to do. But she did it anyway because of a rebellious nature. She had a rebellious nature. I think about Israel over and over and over. They, they had a rebellious nature. Why would they choose a king? Why would they get Saul? Because they, they rejected God. That's what he told Samuel, right? He said, they, they have rejected you. He said, they rejected me. They rebelled against me. I was their leader. But they wanted them a king. They wanted to be like all the other nations. They had a rebellious nature. Not only... Do we see a public acknowledgement of a rebellious nature here of our nature? Verse number 42, you see of our needs as well. He said, we have transgressed and have rebelled, and thou hast not pardoned. So if he's not pardoned, what's our need? Our need is remission. Our need is forgiveness. Our need is a pardon. What's America need? It needs forgiveness of falling into sin. It needs forgiveness of killing babies, of accepting sexual immorality in the name of tolerance. We've gone astray. We've rebelled against God knowing full well what the consequence was. And I believe in many ways God's already took his hand off this country. And I don't know that there's a political candidate that can do us much good. Maybe the best thing that we can hope for is to get one that will follow the Bible and, and maybe at least stem the tide for a while or slow things down. But I, I don't know other than a revival of anything that will really turn America around. And, and I'm holding out hope for revival. And it might start right here. Why couldn't it start right here? 
The scripture, scripture says if you're drawn out of God, he'll draw out of you. Is God truthful or is God a liar? He said you're drawn out of me, I'll draw out of you. Should we take him at his word? If you think we need a revival, if you believe that revival is the only hope for America, would you support a revival? Would, would you support a meeting? Would you come and say, God, I, 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 I know there's a preacher coming and I believe you're going to use that man. And I want to see something this week. I, I want to see a moving of the Spirit. But I guarantee you, you won't see if you ain't here. I want you to come. I'd like to see the house full. I'd like to see the Spirit of God. But the truth is, whether you come or not, I'm going to be here, Lord willing. And, and Brother Todd's going to be here, Lord willing. Somebody's going to preach, probably. Somebody's probably going to sing. And I believe God's going to show up. Now, if you want to get, get in on it, you've got to show up. And I hope if you show up, you prayed up and ready. There's some keys to revival. I hope you can follow that this week. We ought to be on our knees asking God to send a revival. Stand to your feet. Father, we do thank you this, this evening for your grace and mercy. Lord, we realize in many ways that...